All right, so now we're joined by uh, Judge Samuel Chung, who's running for uh, Superior Court Position 15. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Um, I'm Sam Chung, also known as Judge Samuel S. Chung in King County Superior Court. I was appointed by Governor Inslee last May, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, and uh, in early June, I started to, actually June, middle of June, I started working as a King County Superior Court judge. Um, in downtown Seattle. Um, prior to the appointment, I was a civil litigation attorney for about 25 years. Um, I graduated law school George Washington University in uh, Washington, D.C. in 1989. Um, my college education was Columbia University in New York, where I graduated in 1985. Uh, further back, um, <laughs> uh, I was born in Korea. We, my family and I moved to the United States when I was 12. Uh, we started in New Jersey, um, no Jersey jokes today, <laughs> um, and then uh, during law school, um, I met a fellow from the University of Washington, became good friends with him, um, and then I clerked at a law firm here in Seattle, um, and uh, I fell in love with the place, uh, was the right pace for me, the uh, city wasn't too big, it wasn't too small, uh, it was very family oriented, um, so I decided to move on the East Coast and uh, settled out here. Uh, being a judge has been one of the greatest um, uh, honor um, and uh, a joy. Um, I can't think of a higher calling um, uh, because um, given my background as someone um, who had fairly a modest background, um, not really knowing English even when I came to the United States, I love participating in making sure that justice happens. Um, one of the best part of my job is to set the table to make sure that what happens in my courtroom, uh, that people are treated fairly, uh, with compassion, uh, whether you win or lose uh, the case before me, that you walk out thinking that um, it was a fair day um, and I had my uh, voice heard in the courtroom. Um, there's a lot of talk these days about um, uh, whether a certain uh, segment of our population can get a fair trial or our justice system is fair. I still believe it, our justice system may not be perfect, but it's still the best in the world. Um, and I try to do the best job I can every day um, and then try to do a better job uh, the day after. Um, it really is an honor uh, to deal with the public. Um, I see in the eyes of the jurors uh, that uh, uh, come to serve us uh, in, in our courtroom. Uh, they're excited. Uh, they want to find the truth. Uh, they want to make sure that people who are not guilty are freed and people who are uh, put behind bars. Um, it's an honor to meet all of you uh, and thank, for, thank you for your time uh, working on the fifth night of what I understand. So I'm ready for any questions that you may have. Good evening. Great, thank you very much. So now we have our four prepared questions. Uh, these are two-minute answers, and feel free to turn over the piece of paper in front of you if you'd like to read, a, read along as we read them aloud. Uh, Clayton, would you Liz could introduce herself? Uh, well, Liz is lost in membership. I'm sorry. That's all right. Clayton, will you do uh, number one? How would you describe your judicial philosophy? My judicial philosophy is first and foremost to follow the law. Um, I'm not a, legislat a legislator. Um, I have to follow the uh, written uh, statutory law as well as cases uh, that are handed down to me from the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals as well as the uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Um, within the bounds, uh, the discretion that I have, um, I uh, believe that um, justice uh, is the foremost um, and the main uh, reason why I was appointed uh, and that I am here to serve. Um, and that would, means that I have to um, serve the public and make sure that although it may not be the uh, what the public may uh, think is uh, is needed or necessary, I have to uh, do believe. I have to follow my conscience and try to do the right thing. Um, I've had occasions um, where um, 
easier thing for me would have been to just simply rubber stamp um, uh, uh, decisions that were handed down by lower courts. I believe that it is incumbent upon me to read the record, uh, work as hard as I can, uh, and try to be fair, and also be compassionate. We have a lot of people who are not represented, uh, come before uh, our courtrooms, and it's very difficult for them to understand uh, that there are rules and regulations. Um, so we try to, within the bounds, uh, to work with them and make sure that they have a fair hearing. Um, I think um, my philosophy is that um, the underprivileged are uh, also treated fairly, and that whether you're a single mom um, fighting for custody of your child are treated equally as some of the largest corporations that uh, actually are housed in, in, uh, in King County. Uh, so in short, uh, it's fairness uh, to make sure that justice is served. John, number two. Do you support the current system of electing judges, or do you support some other systems, such as appointment, or an appointment and retention election hybrid? And if elections continue, what form of the current campaign finance rules would you support? Um, <laughs> this is a this, uh, question that um, I've had with many judges um, on the bench. Uh, it's not an easy answer to it. Um, I personally believe that um, electing judges does have some merit, um, but uh, I also believe that um, there are pressures that arises from, naturally arises from any election uh, that a judge um, probably shouldn't really think about when he or she is sitting on the bench. Um, oftentimes, uh, uh, judges are, who are facing elections uh, have to deal with issues about who the opponent is and what kind of uh, campaign the opponent runs. Um, and whether the uh, judge likes it or not, uh, you have to be reactive to that. Um, that brings enormous amount of pressure on the work that is being done every day. Um, I bring a considerable amount of work home um, and uh, facing the elections uh, uh, does raise um, issues about uh, limiting your uh, the time that you need to spend uh, to do the right thing. Um, I understand um, the, uh, the why there was elections. I think it is you know, it's, it's good to deal with, uh, to talk to the public and, and be responsive to the people. Um, but uh, the reality is, I think a lot of times, the public doesn't really know who the judges are and end up electing uh, based on the limited information that they have. There are other states who have retention elections uh, where um, the judges are, you know, uh, uh, retained uh, in an election process, uh, which also has some merit. So, I think there are merits on all of these issues, um, but personally, at the end of the day, I think a lot, most of the judges would feel a lot more comfortable um, if they can focus on the work. David, number three. Uh, <clears throat> many people appear without attorney representation in Superior Court. In what ways is it appropriate for a judge to assist someone with the process of a judicial proceeding without appearing biased? You have some excellent questions here. And I don't, um, this is a question I struggle every day um, because um, I realize that in order to have a fair day in court, um, uh, I need to, as I said in the beginning, set the table to make sure that you have a fair hearing. If one side is not represented, um, Although they have to still follow the rules, I mean, there are, um, I'm sure I, the 36th the district has lots of rules and bylaws, etc. Court has more rules than any other place in the world. There's a, you know, a, a joke about there are more rules in hell than any other place in the world. Um, they still have to follow the rules, but I have to tell you that I make sure that although rules are important, 
I make sure that fairness and justice is, is served at the end of the day. Um, and it also depends on uh, the person, pro se, person who is before me. Uh, if the person is simply uh, uh, taking advantage of the fact that, um, that I will give him a break because, give him or her a break because uh, he or she's not an attorney, um, I, don't, I don't think it's proper to bend over backwards in those situations. I will simply say that there are many situations, especially in collection cases, where uh, financial institutions come before me and they want their judgment and it is unopposed. Um, I had one last week where you know, I'm not an attorney anymore, I can't represent the other side, but at the same time, I look through everything I can possible to make sure that her interests are represented. And I, I make sure that the other side isn't, simply doesn't get a rubber stamp on the, on the judgment they would like to have. Um, you know, making sure that justice happens um, is an expensive process, and there are a lot of ingredients that happen. Um, and all those, thi all those things, uh, in, and you have to consider it in context and make sure that pro se uh, uh, feel that they're, um, uh, they had a fair time in court. Michael, number four. Like the rest of government, the courts have struggled with reductions in funding. Where can the courts cut costs and increase efficiency, and how will you advocate for sufficient funding of our judicial branch? We are a third branch of the government, um, and uh, I speak um, both Korean and English. I actually speak some German, which I lost quite a bit now, but um, people who are not fluent in English have a tough time in court. I mean, it's tough to order uh, something in a foreign restaurant, but you know, think about the, the prospect of coming into court and facing the, the, uh, the, the, the cannons from the other side. So the court provides interpreters. I'm on the interpreter committee. Um, which is an excellent, uh, and I think is a necessary uh, uh, requirement. Um, some people take advantage of that. Uh, uh, some people who have means tries to say, well, court provides us, therefore I'm going to, you know, I, I don't need to pay for one. Uh, I've seen cases where um, it's not, uh, it would have been better uh, if we impose the parties, especially in civil cases, that, um, that uh, they have their own interpreters. That's a small example. Um, in terms of other uh, efficiencies, um, I have to tell you that you know, I've been on the bench for about a year now, and um, it works pretty well. Uh, you'd be amazed that the, uh, the, the, the amount of work that judges put in, uh, a lot of judges get up at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, I get emails from them at, at, at 5 a.m. saying, you know, what do you think about this issue? So I would say by and large, uh, we are pretty lean and, I don't say mean, but <laughs> we are pretty <laughs> lean. Um, and, uh, and the staff, I think, are the same way. So um, I'm not a proponent of, you know, cutting our uh, costs. Uh, there are some areas, and I have to profess, I've only been on the bench for a year, so it will take me a little more time to be frightened learn the, uh, the bigger picture to say that I think we can save money here and there, but I gave one example where uh, I think we could uh, do better. Great. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions, and these are one-minute answers. So David and John. <clears throat> uh, in your in introduction, um, uh, we hit all four: truth, honor, happiness, love, right? And and um, uh, uh, I just was wondering uh, what uh, brings you joy outside of the courtroom. Um, I have a nine-year-old, uh, and uh, um, I don't know if I want to be this personal. Um, we had two IVF attempts, and he was uh, we we're successful on the second try, so. Um, he's the pride and joy of our family, um, and uh, we would try to do the right with him, uh, and I think 
family values is, is critical. Um, and uh, but also I you know I volunteered a lot uh, when I was an attorney. Uh, I spent a lot of time in uh, community uh, organizations, uh, and especially given my background, I you know I started a, a, a pro bono legal clinic for Ukrainian immigrants uh, who couldn't speak English, um, and uh, so you know uh, there are a lot of goodness out there in the world, um, and you know lawyers get a bad rap, and you know rightfully so in some instances, but um, you know knowing the English, the law. And being able to write was a tremendous opportunity for me to make an impact, uh, and, and some small, but some big as well. And I can't replace those moments uh, that I was uh, that I truly cherished. And throughout that process, I met a, a lot of great people as well. I mean, I don't want to uh, seem like I'm sucking up to you, but I mean, this is another event where I feel like you know this is democracy in action, and, and uh, so another opportunity to meet more people. So you've only been a, been a judge for a year now. What was your, going into your position, what was your biggest misconception about what it was going to be like to be a judge? Um, I've been in front of many of the judges that I um, uh, uh, call colleagues now, and I had a bit of apprehension about them. Um, uh, I didn't know whether they, you know, when they wear pants, they put one leg, leg at a time. Uh, I, I found out, I had a hard time calling them by their first names. Uh, um, I think the misconception I had was um, that, you know, the law was somewhat monolithic and these people were somewhat sitting in an ivory tower, uh, and it wasn't really so. Uh, the more I got to mingle with the judges, um, I realized that, you know, they're human beings, they're affected by emotion. Uh, one of the best rules I learned was when it's a very difficult case and you know you're going to cry, you know, you have the two, the pinch rule, you just pinch yourself on your thigh. I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, we, we, we wear a robe and you know, we you know, sit behind a high bench, but um, it's, 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 we're just like anybody else. Uh, we just try to do the right thing. Um, yeah, there, I've got time for one more. Um. Seattle's using this new lean program, which sometimes diverts people from being in court, I gather. Um, do you have any comments on that, uh, where people would be given some kind of treatment, uh, I guess, rather than jail time for minor Oh, oh I, I think I know what you're and talking I, I don't about know that. what it stands for. Yeah. It's L-E-A-D. Um. And I imagine those people don't get to your courtroom. Well, I don't know for um, sure if there's some sort of prison. We mainly there. handle felonies, um, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of drug cases. I'm actually on the criminal calendar now. I was on a civil calendar last year. I'm on a criminal mm -hmm. calendar where I handle a lot of um, uh, drug crimes. Um, and uh, if it's a non-violent offense, mm -hmm. um, and it's a, especially it's a first-time offender, then we uh, give them... Um, not a jail time, but a treatment or mm -hmm. other, you know, um, community service, that type of program. You know, I think the, um, the wisdom now is that through the 80s and 90s, um, there was too much emphasis on putting people behind uh, mm -hmm. bars, uh, especially with three strikes you're out, and et cetera. Um, the Washington, Washington State does have... Um, repeated offender laws, just like three strikes around. I had to sentence someone two weeks ago, who, uh, life term, without possibility of parole. I, I, it was a very difficult decision for me. But I think the trend now, uh, the courts and the jurisprudence uh, scholars in, the, uh, in, in, in law are, are now moving away from uh, incarceration, all that stuff that started with Lee Horton and all that in, back in the 80s. I think it's a, I mean, I, because of the judicial ethics, I can't say how I rule this way or that way, or I'm in favor of this or that, but, uh, you know, every defendant who comes before me has a mother, has a sister, or, or a father, um, and, you know, they come and testify and during sentencing, um, and then the other side, the victim's family come and sentence, during sentencing, how cruel and, 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 and uh, uh, deserving 
this person is. So it's a balancing test that I have to do. And Thursday evenings are the hardest uh, days for me uh, because normally on Friday afternoons, not this Friday, I have sentencing, it's criminal sentencing. Mm -hmm. And I gotta be honest with you, I am very soul searching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of that soul searching goes on. Great, so we're about out of time. If you wanna take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Um, you know, I'm not here to say that I'm the best judge in the world. Um, I want to be that person, um, and uh, I, I've been working really hard. Um, it's exciting, you know, uh, uh, to be in a courtroom, to see the, uh, the, uh, the action. I've had some really difficult attorneys I had to deal with, uh, but, you know, in their own way, they're trying to represent their client. Uh, so I understand that. Uh, the most important thing is, I think, um, it has to be a fair process, um, and as draconian as uh, judgments are and, 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 and sentencing is, um, we serve the public, um, and society has to be served. So, you know, only thing I can really say is I try to do the best thing I can every day, um, and, and try to improve every other day, the following day. So, anyways, I want to thank you again for the opportunity. It was a great meeting you. I don't want to sound too uh, corny about it, but it really is the best job in the world. And uh, uh, if you ask any judge, I think they'll, they'll agree. Uh, because, you, you, again, it's uh, watching justice happen. It doesn't happen every day, but at times when it does, it's just magical. So, anyways, thank you again. Thank you very much.